watch his reflection. This is Adventist Reflections, an interpersonal commentary where present biblical truth meets psychological reasoning. Now, to discuss character building ideas, here is your host, Dr. Dent. We have a problem. I don't know how to say good morning. <laughs> Hang on, I, I should know. It's Magandan something. Ah, uh, oh, yes, Magandan Umagapo. Oh, thank you. Pok palai pokayo. I um, I am very happy to be here today with you. I I am excited for uh, a bit of a family reunion here in Tarlac, in the Tarlac, I guess, district. Every time that we have a regional reunion in my in my church area. It's always nice, exciting. It's a happy moment to see people that sometimes you don't see that often. But then you come on Sabbath and you can meet people from other places. I cannot but think of how beautiful it will be when we all get to heaven and we'll have not to separate. Yeah, yeah. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Some of you who have been here every night and we have spent some time together, uh, I'm feeling it. I'll tell you later about it. But um, let's just get into this lecture. What I would like to do is, uh, I would like to have a word of prayer. So if you can bow your head where you are, and I'll just have a quick prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for being here with us today. It's a beautiful day. It's a warm day. It's a Sabbath day. Father, we pray that the rest that we have today may be given by you. We invite your spirit to be here moving amongst us and your angels to be ministering to us. Father, we pray that this place be created in such a way that a hedge may be encircled in this court, so that only you and your angels be ministering to us. And as we speak about how we can be Christians that reflect your character, we pray that it be you who guide us through that process. In the name of Jesus, amen. I was tussling and turning between what am I really going to talk to you about today, and amongst all the things that I thought, I came to these two ideas, to these two topics, and I battled until this morning. I'm prepared to deliver both, but I'm not going to right now. I'm going to share with you about the art of optimism, and I'm hoping to be able to give you 12 steps to be able to show to the community that Christians are happy joyful, Christ-like human beings. And uh, this is part of what we call, you know, the, uh, the it brings aspects of what I do for a living psychology. But psychology really means nothing for our Christian lives unless it's Bible-inspired. So I'm going to show you with every pointer a text that I'm hoping that you can take, embrace, and take it as God says that, not Daniel either. Because I still wanted to share with you the other topic. What I decided to is, um, it, it's a topic for young people. This one is for everybody. The afternoon one will be for young people, but I hope everybody stays. And in the afternoon, what will happen is, uh, I'm assuming it's announced, I don't know, but we will have a little topic for the young people. All people stay as well. But we'll have a little box. we have a little box. Uh, do we have a little box? <laughs> do we have a little box? <laughs> no. We, yes, we do. Where is the box? All right. Whoever is in charge of the box, please bring it forward when you are ready during this presentation. What I would like is, I would like that box to be here. And I would like anybody, it's for young people, but anybody can uh, write a question in a paper. You do not have to put your name. I want this to be, in fact, anonymous. I don't really want to know who you are unless you want to come to tell me personally. But otherwise, we'll do it very privately in the sense that if you are going to remain anonymous, 
And you can ask any question. We don't promise to have the answer, but we promise to make our best so that this afternoon we'll answer these questions. I have invited some of the pastors to come forward and we'll have a bit of a panel. I'll join them and then we'll read the questions and by the grace of God, with the wisdom of a couple of people, we'll be able to answer some of these questions. They could be Bible uh, related questions or it could be anything that you want to do, say, psychologically, mental health, health wise. Uh, we can also try and do that. Um, and we'll try to keep it Christian-like, of course. All right. The art of optimism. The Lord says in Psalm 103, verse, 103, verse 2, Bless, O Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. What David is telling us in this psalm is, you know, I need to glorify God in everything that happens to me. In good and in bad. Now, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story because I think it will make it a little bit easier. I'll show you some pictures just because of the sake of it. It's part of the story. And it was about 3 a.m. in the morning when my eyes opened and I found that my heart was racing more than usual. And as I remember, I woke up in this place that wasn't my home. My wife was still next to me. My kids went, were in a different room. And I remember that I had to get up because I needed to go. I needed to go and prepare for my first ever race that I was going to have in an ultra marathon. So... That is my family. That is me. Um, I keep on showing you pictures if you've been here at night or talking about my family because I am madly in love with them and therefore I cannot help it. So I am sorry if you don't like to see them. But that's them. Uh, and so they always come with me to every run that I do. And so the time came that 4 o'clock click and tick. And I was finding myself at the race line. And as I found myself in the race line, I thought to myself, is this something that I should be doing? Have I trained good enough? I'm not sure that I should be here. And as my thought processes were coming on, it was too late for me to go out of this run because the gun hit and we set on this big race. And so as I prepared, I kept on running, and I kept on running, and I kept on running. And then I run some more, and some more, and some more. Eventually we finished. And after we finished, something clicked in my mind that everything that we do is worth it. Even the pain that you suffer when you run. And so when we go in life, sometimes we don't want to run. We feel like we want to give up. Sometimes we feel worthless, helpless, and hopeless. Sometimes we feel that we don't want to continue, but the training that we have in life is what we will, what will help us to go in this Christian walk. So today I would like to propose that we can train our mind to be able to be the best positive Christians that we have, so that when you are going out in the community, people don't see you and they see, I don't want to be a Christian because I don't want to be like that man or that woman, that young person. They seem to be always grumpy. And so today I would like to start by saying that we should be counting our blessings. We should be counting our blessings. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are uh, lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if, it, if there be any praise, think of these things. What the Bible is saying is, it's saying, you know, we could dwell on the negative things, or we could dwell on the good things of life. So, it is important for us to count our blessings. One of the first things that I tell my patients when we come to therapy, when they are depressed, I say, look, 
We need to ensure that we rewire our brain and we try to train it in such a way that we remember that life is not all morning and pitiful. The countdown came. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And off we went in this race that we had on that Sunday at four o'clock in the morning. It was summer. A lot of people, when I'm being here, ask me, how is Australia's weather? Are you hot here? And I say, you bet I'm hot. It's very humid. I'm sweating right here, right now. But Australia can get hot and humid too, very. We get 36, 37, 40, 41, 42 degrees, no problem, where I live. This race was on the coastline in a place called the Gold Coast. Now, the breeze held from the ocean, but the humidity was very, very high. So as we continue on running, I thought to myself, okay, things are going okay. <clears throat> things are going to turn out okay. I train a little bit for this, perhaps not the best, but I train enough. And I run one kilometer, two kilometers, and probably about kilometer three, I started to feel unwell. And my legs started to play up. I started to feel pain in my ankles. And I started to feel pain in my back. And so I thought, this is not good. I still have 47 kilometers to go. And it's only kilometer three. How am I going to finish this? How am I going to finish this? Point number two. <clears throat> Look on the bright side of life. Look on the bright side of life. There is a verse in Romans 8.28. Who knows that verse? Romans 8.28. Nobody knows Romans 8.28. Sister Lisa. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. That is it. For we know that all things work together for good for them that love the, that love the Lord. For them who are called according to what? His purpose. So the idea is that we are to look on the bright side. We are to look on the bright side. Because God has called you for a purpose. Sometimes you don't see it, but it is true. Philippians chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 says... I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I learned to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to be abound. In everything, I am instructed to both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. What Paul is saying, he's saying, look, when I am poor, I am happy. When I am rich, I am happy. When I have food, I am happy. When I have no food, I am happy. When I have freedom, I am happy. When they put me in jail, I was happy because I was serving God. And so the point is we need to be content. Count our blessings and, and be content. Be content. One of the things that I can tell you is that as I was going on this run on that time, many years ago, I was struggling a lot like I mentioned. And so... I decided I had two options. I have a couple. I have more than two. But either I quit or I continue. But if I continue, I had to put up with the pain for the next four and a half, five hours. So I took the choice. It's always a choice. I took the choice to continue. And I took the choice to think about this experience as something that will help me in the next run. So, what I want to tell you is that the way we see things will, will create an environment whereby I, our brain will learn and decide how to take it the next time. If I quit on that run that day, the next run that I have, I will quit most likely again. The probability increases. And so, it is about how we choose to see what happens to us in life. I'll give you an example. Everything that comes... For those who love God comes together for good. One day I was playing soccer with some of my church members. And um, and somehow, for some reason, uh, I broke my foot. 
And I was so upset about breaking my foot. Because when I broke my foot, it meant that I couldn't really move that much. I couldn't run, and that's really what I like doing. I couldn't really go to work. I couldn't really play with my girls outside. And so I decided that I have a couple of options, but it come down to two. Either I soak and get depressed because of what happened to me, or I choose to see what is good about the fact that I broke my foot. And one of the good things is that I took time off work and work was happy to keep on paying me when I wasn't even there. I don't know if you think that's a good blessing. I think it is a good blessing. Even if they didn't pay me, if I could take time off work to be with my family as a result of breaking my foot because I have an excuse, it would have been positive. I give you another example. Some of you might have heard this before, but my father died about uh, six years ago. And he died very young. He was 60, 61, something like that. And as he died, he didn't die just suddenly. In fact, he died from cancer, bowel cancer. And I don't know if you have cancer, if you ever had somebody who had cancer, or you had seen somebody who died from cancer. But if you have, you will know that it's a horrible illness and disease. It kills you usually slowly, but when you come to the last stages of cancer, you go quickly, but very painfully. Some people don't have that pain, but my father did. And as he suffered and suffered and suffered, I recall the time when I talked to him on, on Skype, on video, and he said, son, you know, all I want you to do is pray for me so that I die. Now, I don't know who of you can do that prayer. It took me a lot of efforts to pray for that. I didn't say, God, kill him. I said, God, I don't want to see him suffering. Today, I can tell you that when he died, I suffered. I cried. I cried a lot. My father was one of my counselors of life. God appointed him to give me some good counsel. He is not here any longer. So I cried. But I could decide to either get depressed and continue crying for the rest of my life. I'm still sad. As I tell you this story, I feel sad. But I have another option as well. What can I see good in the fact that he died? And obviously in my mind is that I could see now that he is gone, that he suffers no longer. So in the illness, in the death that he has gone through, now he sleeps, he knows nothing, he has no pain, he has no memory, he is waiting for the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. To me, that is that gives me happiness. To me, that makes me and compels me to be positive. Aspect number three. Don't feed the greed-eyed monster. I don't know if you've seen these pictures on social media. Um, uh, to me, I, I have seen them many years ago. They're funny. You know, many of us, for some reason, many of us are like this little girl, right? Like we see somebody else happy and we wish we were them. She's not happy at all. That wouldn't be very happy Christian, right? Or you could have a set of twins, right? Same life, same life, but all of a sudden one is happy, but the other twin is not very happy. So how come some Christians are happy in whatever comes, but some aren't? Some of us live with this idea that we wish to have somebody else's life. And social media, young people, social media has made a bit of damage to us because every time we see Facebook, every time we see Instagram, every time we see Snapchat, every time we see whatever media that you have, people don't post their bad pictures. People always put their happy pictures, their holidays, their basketball court tournament, their school graduation, their friends outing, eating some halo halo together, whatever. There is always a happy picture and so there I am looking at the picture and when I look at the picture I feel I wish I had that. But the reality is they are going through the same thing you are going through. They only put in the happy stuff and so do you. And somebody else in the world, when they see your happy pictures, thinks the same. I wish I had those friends. I wish I was eating that halo halo right now. It's very hot. So we need to think about that. The Bible indeed gives us guidance. But look at this picture. There is this people, there are these alpacas. Do you have alpacas in the Philippines? No? 
They are very popular in Peru. Peru. We have them in Australia, imported. They're the leaks, like, not like camels, but not really, they're not really camels, so it's not a good comparison. So, they're eating grass on the other side of the fence. This is a bit silly because on their fence, on their side, they have grass as well, and it's beautiful, and it's green, and it's lushing, but for some reason, they go through the struggle to squeeze through to eat the grass on the other side of the fence. It makes no sense. There are people sitting here, I am confident, who go through the struggles of life trying to get somebody else's lifestyle. And you get in debt, and you ask the bank for money, and you sell things, and you almost sell your soul so that you can eat grass on the other side, whereas in your side you can have beautiful grass with what you have. Does that make sense? Yes? Only a couple of yeses, thank you. <laughs> The same thing happened with this cow. Now, in Australia, I don't know here, but this fence is not any type of fence. This fence is an electric fence. If that cow touches that fence, it'll get a zap, a big zap. One day I was with one of my uh, church deacons, and I went to visit him, and as we're walking around his house, in his yard, in his property, I looked around and we're looking at this dam, like a water hole, and I have, and the, his fence was there, his fence was there, and I just got closer to the fence and I look, and when I looked, I got the zap of my life. I have never gone through that. I tell you, it hurts. I fell from my foot, just my, my chin touched that cable at the bottom, and it went all through my body, my heart felt it. It's not pretty. A lot of people prefer to suffer so that they can eat on the other side. So that they can have what is somebody else's. Don't do that. Don't do that. Same thing with this one. Or what about this horse? Going through that little hole was he could eat on his side. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 13, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word is spoken in due season, how good it is. What the Bible is saying is, we should be encouraging to other people. A positive, happy, compelling Christian, as you go out of this place and go into your daily lives, people will feel attracted to you, not because they see you, but because they see Christ. But they can only see Christ if you practice Christ-like behaviors. One of them is this. The Bible says, you know, tell somebody how good they can be. There is a difference between being flattering you are not to flatter anybody because the Bible says, you know, we shouldn't flatter people. When you flatter people, people feel proud. But you should recognize how good other people could be. The talents, the gifts, the efforts they put. The fact that you came here today is beautiful. Many of you come from far away. So take a time to have a word of kindness to somebody else, it will make you happy. In your state of depression, this service will take you out of that self-pityness that you might be experiencing. Perhaps, perhaps you could visit somebody else. As I was running, it must have been kilometer 21, maybe. And I noticed no, it was kilometer five, five. And I, as I was running, I noticed this young man who was running as well. And as he was running, I thought I recognized this young man. He's older than me, but he's young. So I think I'm young. <laughs> A man, right? So, so as he's, as he's running, I think, I think, I think this is this guy that I know. As I kept on running, I thought, you know, he runs so beautifully, you know. I'm here struggling. Remember, I started to struggle kilometer three. This is kilometer five. We still have 45 kilometers to go. And as I'm running my way, he just passes next to me. He passes next to me with a graceful, very soft, smooth, but fast running pace. And as I looked at him... I feel like, I think this is the guy that I know. And I felt, I wish I could be that guy. And as soon as I wished that I could be that guy, I started remembering how much pain I had. 
Because he looked like he had no pain and I'm here hurting everywhere and we are not even one tenth of the way. Well, we're about one tenth. And I thought, I wonder if he's, if it's him. We continue running and we were kilometer 21. Remember, this is 50 kilometers race. So it's about, for me, it's about five hours and, and more than that. So for the people who are fast, like this guy, it's not, nothing close to five hours. They go very quick. And as we're going kilometer 21 or so, I see this guy coming back already. I'm thinking, I certainly don't deserve to be here. (laughs) But as I see him coming from far away, I could see him now from the front. And it was him who I thought he was. You see, this guy, this guy about eight years earlier, he introduced me to the world of ultra marathon running. For a year, we ran a little bit, we kept in touch, he gave me books, we talked, we had this passion for running. My passion was to go out to see what God had made. His passion, I have no idea what it is, but we had a common interest. And one day he said, you know, uh, take this book, and I read this book, and in this book I read that there are people who run 100 kilometers, 160 kilometers, and I'm thinking, this is not possible, this must be a joke. But there are people out there, let me tell you, who don't stop in life with the easy things. They say, I want to get better, not because somebody else has something, but because God calls us to be heads and not tails. God calls us to be the best that we can be with whatever we have. And so I got into this world of ultramarathon and punishing your body. As he came back and I see and identify him, All that could come into my mind was to compliment him. And I say, Sanjay, Sanjay is his name. I say, Sanjay, hey, you are a bullet, man. And he just passes quickly. He looked at me, he just went like this and kept on running. And then I wondered, did he even know who I was? I don't know. Do something for somebody else. You never know what word of encouragement can help somebody. There are people here, I guarantee that, I've been in many churches and have done what I do for a living for too long maybe, that look like they're happy, but they are not. Even if a person looks like they have it all together, go out of your way to give a hand. Later on, I got to know that this, my friend, was also struggling. Perhaps you could go on the street And instead of riding your tricycle and get in front of everybody else, give somebody else a way and then go. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.15, Wherefore, come for yourselves together and edify one another and even also ye do. So point number five, nurture relationships. Nurture relationships. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that we should gather together to nurture each other in love, to be united, to have a perfect communion with Christ. Sometimes we are not very good at it. Sometimes in Christianity, it's almost as if we are competing with each other because we cannot be happy with what we have. The Bible says, you know, instead of thinking about what somebody else is doing, nurture that relationship Be happy because of this person doing whatever they're doing. Be happy because your friend is having the race of his life while I am here in pain. Because when you are happy for the other person, when you nurture the relationship, you will forget what's happening to you. You'll move on. You'll move on. So rejoice, meet together, don't neglect to have your family. Your family is just here for a moment. Sometimes our moms, our dads, our uncles, our cousins, our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, they are not very nice people, but I tell you the truth. I have seen people who hate other people, but the moment they die, they are on the graveyard crying, wishing that they had a better relationship with that person. Ecclesiastes says, I know that there is no good in men, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor, the gift of God. My friends, point number six is for you to get lost. I don't know if you know what that means in English, but when somebody tells you get lost, it's not very nice. 
But this is not the root get lost, but rather I would like to encourage you to get lost in a project that you cherish. Embrace yourself in something that you are looking forward to. Be positive in looking forward to a book, a nice Christian uplifting song. Have a project of your own that you can share perhaps with your experience with somebody. I engage in running because I like it, but these projects of running help me to share something with you. Engage with something that has some value. Volunteer doing something. I love these guys that I came to see here, the voice of the youth. Is that what it is? The voice of the youth. Because they are out there in the community reaching out to people, showing the love of Christ, praying with people, visiting the sick, visiting the needy. Maybe, I know that some of them have more needs than maybe some people, some of the people they visit. But that doesn't matter because they're happy to go out there and be some positive influence with somebody else. That's their project. Perhaps plan a trip to Man Arayat. I don't know. I'm assuming it's nice. I only been told about. Go and do something. You don't have to have a lot of money to get lost into a hobby. My friend Julius, he loves basketball and he spends ungodly time just shooting on the hoop, just like I spend ungodly time running for hours on the streets. Have a hobby of your own. This will not only give a positive outlook of life, but it will help you to mingle with somebody else who do not know Christ. The Bible says in Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse, verse 12, Remember his marvelous works that he had done, his wonders in the judgments of his mouth. Point number seven, we are more than halfway through. Remember when. Remember when. As I was going through this struggle, and I'm running, I might be in about kilometer 36 perhaps. And I managed to go through, but when you have another 14 kilometers to go, that's an eternity once you are aching for the last three hours or so. And so, and so one of the things that I utilize is this technique. The Bible says, Remember what God has done for you. Remember where you came from. Remember His judgments. Remember the good things of His works. And so, what I'm telling you here is, we can utilize the good things that God has done for you to get out of where you are right now. And you can make this practical. Sometimes we like to guide people to the Bible, and that's good. The Bible is the source of all wisdom. It is the Word of God. But God is a practical God. And so what I'm telling you here is, I want to invite you to, when you're struggling, remember when there were good times. You know that God saw you through. And one of the things, as I was sulking a little bit, I said, you know, I had a choice. I either can quit yet again, or I could not quit and continue. And I chose, as I was going through there, to remember what God has done. And I chose to remember that He created my body beautifully. And that led me to something very practical, which was, Daniel, you run marathons before, you run races before, you have gone in pain, but you have finished. This is not the first time that you have run, perhaps the first time that you run this distance, but you can do this because God says that we are marvelously and wonderfully created. It's part of the fact that I punish my body unnecessarily, of course. So remember, remember what God has done for you in the past. The Bible says that every time the people of Israel will forget, will forget where they came from, will forget when they came from Egypt, they will always backslide. They will always go back to the drinking, to the gluttony, to the whatever drugs they use, to the sexual immoralities, to worshiping idols. They always went back to where they came from. And God says, remember where I brought you out from. In your tough times, remember that not everything has been gone that bad. There have been times when God has seen you through. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5.3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. What the Bible is saying is, there are a lot of people who talk, 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 but do nothing, nothing, nothing. 
So, point number eight, pursue a long time neglected goal. There are many of you sitting here who wish you did something and you didn't do it perhaps because you didn't carry it through. You didn't feel motivated. Perhaps you didn't have the resources, but now you're sitting here and you're like, you know, I'm better than back 10, 5, 15, 20 years ago. Maybe today I can do what I once wanted to do. God is saying, you know, don't just think about things, act upon things. The same thing happens in the spiritual life. Don't just think about, I'm going to change. You know, Daniel said the other night that we should not eat this and this. Not because I said it, but because the Bible said it. Don't just think about it, act upon that. Because the Bible says that for you just to talk, talk, talk and do nothing, 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 it's of foolish people. So pursue something else. You know, a lot of people here are sitting and wish, you know, I wish I had a better lifestyle. Oh, you know, the, the health message that a Seventh-day Adventist church will embrace. But how much of the end loss of health do you really do? You preach it, you teach it, but do you do it? Do we only talk about, you know, exercise, prayer, but do we stop drinking coffee? Or we talk about, you know, you know, this book, uh, Sister White, and, but how many of you are vegetarians here? The foolishness of Christianity, the weakness of Christianity is that we talk, and when we go out on the, on the world, we do totally different to what we believe. The Bible says, don't do that. Doesn't matter how old you are. There are people that it could be, you could be young, you could be older, you could enhance your life by choosing to do what you know that is right. Don't continue thinking, you know, one day I will be in great shape. One day I will feel healthy and fit. You can do that today. Don't talk a lot, just act. Don't post it on Facebook saying, New Year, new resolution. The resolution has to happen today. The world doesn't need to know. This is between you and God and maybe a best friend who, who can support you. The Bible says, Psalm 4, 8, I will both lay down my head in peace and asleep. For the Lord knows that him, for, for the Lord only makes me dwell in safety. I would like to invite you to cope with life calmly. Take your time to relax. Take your time to relax. It doesn't matter if you have to work. There is always time to take time to relax. Let me tell you something. Some people feel guilty when they take time off. I cannot do anything, you know. Even Jesus Christ took time to relax. His time to relax was to spend the whole night with his father in prayer. More than once, when something important had to happen, when a decision had to take place, the Bible says he went and spent all night in prayer. The next day, he chose his disciples. Another occasion, he was tired. He fed 5,000. He healed people. And then the next thing we know, he said to, the, to his disciples, go on the other side, I'll meet you there. The Bible says that he went away and he spent time in prayer because the next day, guess what? He had to cast out a legion of demons. Take time to relax. Take it easy. Life is very quickly going. Sometimes we struggle to, you know, ma make ends meet. To make sure we put food on the table. But we killed ourselves. And by the time we got to 50, 60, some of us will die young. Because we worked so hard just to put some food on the table. And we have to. But you die and then nobody will feed your children after that. Take the time to have some time to relax. As I finish this race, and as I have to finish this conversation, I remember that the most important thing wasn't really for me to be there in that race. For me, the most important thing was glorifying God and meeting the three women that God gave in my life that were waiting for me on the other side of the finish line. When I left, my girl says, Go daddy, go daddy, you can do it. Three kilometers later, I really didn't think I could. And as I continue, one of the strategies that I utilized was I took time to relax, even in the stressful moment. You see, my, my, my body, my whole body was aching. My mind was saying, this is silly, just stop. And when I realized that I was running here and I forgot the reason why I actually ran, 
I mentioned to you that I spend time, hours on the road, on the run, on the trail, on nature, running because I, this is the time that I have with God by myself. As I'm running, I pray for people. As I'm running, I'm rehearsing my memory verses. As I'm running, I'm talking to God about how hard my life can be. He is my chief psychologist. And when I remember that, when I remember that I had to take some time to embrace my surroundings, the here and the now, I remember what I was running. I remember that on my right side, there was this beautiful see-through blue ocean that I just needed to turn and look at and remember how great God was and continues to be. The Bible says, James 5, 16, confess your, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye what? That ye may be healed. Pray of a righteous man availeth much. <clears throat> My friends, there are many of you here who are carrying some burden because you cannot let go. Because somebody hurt you, because somebody did something to you, I have seen people who have left church because somebody didn't greet them the next Sabbath. The Bible says, you know, if you have something, if you did something to somebody else, or if somebody did something to you, confess it. You know, say, look, you hurt me and I feel really hurt. Uh, maybe I'm silly. I don't know. Uh, Lord, help me. Help me so that I don't carry this burden in me. Let it go. Let it go. You cannot live a positive Christianity. You cannot present yourself sincerely in the world to reach out to people to Christ unless you let go of your burdens. The Bible says, God says, Jesus says, you know, leave your burdens before the cross. Leave them with me. Leave everything that is dragging you down, you know. There is this man called John Banyan. Who knows John Banyan? John Banyan? I'll tell you with a book that he wrote. Maybe you will know who he is now. John Banyan is the author of The Pilgrim's Progress. Ever heard of that book? No? Highly recommend it. Download it for free on Google. I'm sure there is free copies. The, Pilgrim, the Pilgrim's Progress. The, the, um, Sister White talks about The Pilgrim's Progress book. In The Pilgrim's Progress, we had this guy. His name was Christian. The book says that as he's walking on the street, Christian has this big sack that he's carrying and he's like bent like this and he cannot move. But as he's walking and walking, eventually in his Christian journey, in the temptations, in the struggles, eventually he comes to the cross of Christ at Calvary and the, and, and the cross and Christ says, you know, just leave them here. But he had a choice. He said, I'm not sure, you know, I'm used to carrying these things. There is some of us here today that we like to feel like the way we feel. Some of us here feel like, you know, when I, when I feel sad, it's like, you know, I feel in touch with my emotions. I don't know. Some of us feel like you cannot, because you don't know any better for many years, you feel like this is the way you need to be. But God says, you know, Christian, leave that, that thing there. And the, and the book says that Christian actually said, okay, Lord, I leave it here. And when he says that, when he accepted, it disappeared. He got healed. He got straight up and he walked so light. Reconciled with people. I wish I had more time and I'll give you a hint of an exercise of how you can reconcile with people. Uh, anyway, maybe in the afternoon. I'll think about it. Remember, there are people out there who you will, you will miss if they were not here. But yet you don't talk to. There is a saying in English that says, uh, nobody knows what they, why they have until what? They see it gone until it's lost. The Bible says, let us consider one another for good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. What I would like to invite you is to get involved. Don't just come to church to warm the seats. Don't just come to church to be served. One of the things that we need to do, we have to get involved. The voice of youth, you know, there is a group of people here that sang, 
but I see a lot of more young people in this place. And as well, I see a lot of older people in this place. Older people, don't just leave them alone. Don't just say, I did my time. Let me tell you something. The Bible doesn't speak about retiring from the Word of God. The work of God doesn't have retirement. So do something with these young people. And young people, if you're not involved, I invite you. I'm maybe crossing the line because I'm not the leader of this group. Gilbert, I think, is one of those people who leads uh, Seth, uh, Mar, I don't know. Come over and reach out to these guys and say, you know, I want to be involved too. Because something happens, something beautiful happens. When we serve people, we stop thinking about our own pitiful life. Which, by the way, is not pitiful. Get involved, reach out, talk to people, embrace people. The last one, and we finish. We over time, and we don't even have a translator. I always go over time. Give me a translator or don't give me a translator. I go over. So very, don't feel bad. It's me. Psalm 139, 14 says, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right. My friends, some of you don't treat yourselves well. Some of you don't treat yourself well. My Bible tells me that your body is the temple of your Holy Spirit. My Bible tells me that you were beautifully made. You might think you're ugly. You might think you're fat. You might think you're too skinny. You might think you're too tall. You might think you're too short. You might think you're way too pretty for everybody. You might think you're way too ugly for nobody. The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't really care what your mom, what your dad, what your sister, what your uncle, what your friend, what the neighbor said to you. My God says you are done. You are made. You were created to my image. Therefore, you are good enough and beyond. Why? Because if you accept Christ, you were bought by a way, way high price. The highest price anybody could pay for you and your life by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, point number 12 and last point is, be good to yourself. Be good to yourself. Again, I reaffirm and confirm, don't just talk, that's foolish, act. If you are not happy because you are fat, I'm not saying you, know, you are fat. I'm getting fatter here in the Philippines, by the way. You see the pictures I show you, I look a lot fitter than I am now. This is what uh, 16 days of very little physical activity gives you. Um, and really good food. And so, and so the, Bible, the Bible says, be good to yourself. If you are bigger, don't wait because the weight won't be lost miraculously. Do something about it. If you are too skinny, don't wait to put a muscle. You know, you don't have to have money to go to the gym. Just in the place where you live, do exercises that will help you to, you know, be a little bit fitter. If you are too tall or too short, you cannot help it. Just embrace what God has given you. Because let me tell you something, ladies. If you are too short and you think you are too short, let me tell you a secret. Tall people, for some reason, like short women. I don't know why. I have observed that around the world. I've been in many countries. And you see really tall guys with really short ladies. Now, guys, if you are the guy like, I'm too short, don't worry about it. God made you that way. And let me tell you something. There is more power in a compact body. My friend who run and fly past through, he is about this height of mine. It doesn't matter what you have. If you remember that God made you beautifully, you will not go back to think that you are not good enough. Embrace life. Choose. How are you going to see your glass of water? I don't know if you have that saying in the Philippines. In English we say, you know, are you gonna, do you see the glass half full? Or do you see half empty? Right? That doesn't mean that you're gonna put your pink glass, uh, um, glasses. I don't know if you have that either in the Philippines, but when we say, you know, when you're putting your pink or roses colored glasses, what we mean is that people feel like they are just, everything is happy. There is, there is nothing worse than seeing somebody who seems always happy because you know that they are fake. What we are talking here is having a joyful, positive attitude in life because God tells us to have one and I gave you 12 steps to have it. But what it doesn't mean is to be fake. Because I share with you, you know, when my dad died, I cried. It's okay to show that we are humans. Because that's the only way that you'll be able to relate to people outside. If people ever see you happy ever after, and they don't see that the reality is you struggle. 
But even though you might struggle to get food, even though that you're struggling to make ends meet in your home financially, you are still joyful, but you share the struggles and you say, I'm struggling too, but by the grace of God, I'm going through here and I'm not going to give up. I'm finished with the verse that Paul says, I've learned to be content. No matter what state you have, I have learned to be content. And one of the reasons, the primary reason why he could do that is because he said, in Christ, I can do everything. You can finish this race and you can finish it happy, with joy, with Christ. For God says, I know the plans that I have towards you, plans to prosper you. I have a future for you, says God. Would you decide to take that promise and be happy? Be joyful. Be positive today. That's my desire. That is my prayer. And that is for what I'm going to pray right now as we finish. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much. You, you left wisdom in the Bible that now in the profession that I do in psychology, we see it, but the Bible had the guidelines a long time ago before psychology even came to happen. Father, I pray that we don't see it because of how the world sees it, but we see it because of what you said to us today in your word. And so we pray that if anybody is struggling with some of the things that we spoke about today, that you help them, that the message be embraced, and that they don't go out like the foolish people who get instigated in their hearts, in their minds, but who desire to today act and become Christ-like. And in His name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless. Remember to subscribe to this podcast, like it, share it, hashtag it, comment, and find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and Tumblr as Adventist Reflections. God bless you.